It's time to awaken your inner traveler and zip around the world as money is sent to the people who rely on it. Welcome to Money Travels, presented by Visa. For my mom and my grandma, if I ever wanted to send them money, it was easy. I think that sending and receiving money in the Dominican Republic, it's like probably the number one thing that people do. But I can tell you in five years, two businesses, never once has that money not gone in within 24 hours. It is extraordinary. A lot of coffee producers live in abject poverty and you can't fault them. They're going to take the money they can get that day because they have to go feed their kids. Two business days in New York real estate is, is an eternity. Things come and go in split seconds. You have to have access to funds and you got to be able to act on it instantly. We are all connected. We have more ways to interact now than ever before. And it's never been easier to send and receive money to more places across the globe. So what is the invisible infrastructure that makes that possible? I'm Indre Viscontis, a neuroscientist, author, and host of Money Travels, presented by Visa. On this podcast, we follow the money as it zips around the world, helping us to survive and thrive and we talk to the experts who are building the tools that will transform the next generation of money movement. Julieta needs to send money home to the Dominican Republic. Sarah wants to sell used books at local markets. Jay's clients need access to money fast, or else they might lose the apartment. And Ed has to pay his coffee farmers today so they can feed their kids tonight. Behind each of these interactions is an invisible infrastructure that moves money. To help us navigate this vast network, today we're talking to the global head of Visa Direct, Ruben Salazar. Ruben helped build this global money movement network, and he can speak to the remaining challenges and to the future of how money travels. So welcome to Money Travels, Ruben. Thank you, Indri. Uh, thank you for having me here. So I want to start by taking you back to your childhood, and there's a purpose to this, so bear with me for a bit. but. What was it like for you to grow up in El Salvador in the 1980s? Well, I, I will say my childhood and my teenager years were, I mean, surrounded by this, you know, 12 year civil war um, that, you know, um, was happening in, in the country. And I saw many of my close family members, you know, emigrating and traveling, you know, to other places, you know, to just find refugee or or try to develop better living conditions for themselves. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, it was a, a time of a lot of struggles, um, not only for me, but for five, six million individuals living in, in El Salvador. And uh, it was, you know, hard times going to school or, you know, going to a party or a stage of siege uh, and it was kind of part of our everyday life and, and that's that's the um, reality in which I grew up. And so when did you leave and where did you go first? Well I I first left in 1992 to uh, the University of New Mexico to study some uh, postgraduate um, um, studies in um, mass communication and journalism um, mm. at that time i i was uh, starting my my career in journalism and you know that piece of education was very important to continue to grow and i started to work as a news tv reporter in 1988 and i left that profession in 1993, 1994, more or less. And why? What, what, um, you know, what's, what changed your career path? Well, you know, the, the peace accords were signed in 1992. And at that time I was working for the presidency of, uh, El Salvador for the equivalent of the white house. I was doing some mass media work for them. And after the peace accords were signed, I decided that it was time for me to, you know, achieve careers and focus in the communication aspect of my uh, formal education. So I did a, 
a migration to marketing um, at that time and I started with advertising, a little bit of production and and suddenly I was working with, you know, big corporations doing marketing for them, like, you know, Citibank and some other big companies. And I I did the transition from journalism to marketing in, in about one or two years. Wow. And when you were when you started working for the banks, um, I imagine that a lot of the experiences you had uh, growing up in in El Salvador with all of this turmoil, you know, that it must have influenced how important or how you know sort of the the way in which money movement can play a role in people's lives. Is that? Can you tell me a little bit about sort of what what? your early experiences, how they influenced your view on how to get money to people who need it? I, I think I started to see a very clear correlation uh, between access to banking and the alleviation of poverty. You know? um, mm. And that was a, a critical uh, you know, point of view from somebody who works in a bound, but try to have an empathy for the type of uh, customers that we're trying to serve. Um, closer to home, my, my older brother went to California um, in, in the early 80s. And I, I, I saw him, you know, sending um, money to my uh, mom every month, you know, even though he was in California, he was trying to help uh, his siblings and his family to get through because civil war doesn't recognize, I mean, social income levels. Everybody gets affected and everybody is economically struggling. It doesn't matter where you are. I mean, it, um, and at that time, and everybody was, I mean, trying to understand there is a high inflation, dollars are a precious commodity in, in, in this mm -hmm. market. So receiving dollars from outside was, you know, double or triple your, your salary in, in one day. You know, it was, it's mm -hmm. what, it was an important aspect of, you know, uh, making the living uh, at that time. It still is in many countries. At the top of the show, we heard from Julieta, a 20-something from the Dominican Republic who works in New York and sends money back to her family. So, and I saw my mom going to a small banks and a small agencies and, you know, all these places to collect the money that my brother used to send. And that was a, a great support for us, you know, at that time. And, mm -hmm. and so I was like eight, nine years old. So I started to, to see the, the complexities of money movement. I mean, um, very early, you know. Mm -hmm. And when I when I started to work for my first job in a bank was for Citibank and Citibank is is a bank that is focused more in the high income um, uh, level of the population. Um, but I start I start seeing that I mean it, there is no I mean these um, inefficiencies in money movement doesn't discriminate you know doesn't mm -hmm. matter if. If you have a high income or low income, mm -hmm. the um, fragmentation and the problem of sending money affects us all. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. From microeconomic point of view, of course, affects uh, uh, the uh, poor families uh, and the medium income families uh, more. You know, mm -hmm. Be because of the fees, because of the cost at that time of you know mo moving. I mean, money from one country to another. But the reality is, is that um, it affects us, everybody. Yeah, in fact, there's a, I read a, 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 something that you had written in which you quoted some World Bank data saying that from 1990 to 2015, the global rate of extreme poverty, so living less than, than $1.90 per day, dropped on average one full percentage point per year. Here, I'm, I'm quoting you, <laughs> quoting the World Bank, from nearly 36% to about 10.1%. And you wrote that one reason for this drop is the increased rate at which migrant workers in foreign countries can send money home to their families. Can you tell me a little bit about that and sort of, you know, what, what has enabled it to become easier and more efficient? 
That is absolutely correct. Let me use El Salvador as, a, as an example. Um, El Salvador is a country with a population of about five to six million individuals. No? During the war, almost two million individuals left. They left to the United States, mm -hmm. to Canada, to Nordic countries, to Australia. To It was a complete diaspora because the, the violence was a, a very... Uh, uh, you know, difficult uh, at that time. No? Mm -hmm. Those two million individuals started to s send money back home because they, their, I mean, um, aspiration was to move to provide better living conditions for their own family. Today, in El Salvador, almost 25%, 25% of the entire GDP depends on that diaspora, on that, wow. in, I mean, a group of, uh, individuals who left during the war and they continue to send money to, 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 to their home country and it moves by generations. And so the leap uh, from the poverty line to a better living condition is highly correlated to this massive migration for El Salvador. In 2000, because of this influx of uh, dollars in, in the economy, in 2000, El Salvador actually dollarized the economy. Because hmm. at that time it was already like 10 or 15 percent of all the uh, flows uh, were coming in, in dollars. No? Hmm. Um, and, and that gives you an idea. I mean, uh, many countries like El Salvador goes for through the same sort of cycle. No? Today, remittances and the volume of this financial aid is bigger than agriculture. Uh, in in terms of uh, GDP contribution, so yeah, that that is telling you that it's not work, it's not I mean jobs, it's not uh, you no know, the local government uh, uh, policies that are changing the economic infrastructure of uh, comp of countries that depend on on remittances to alleviate uh, poverty or provide um, better um, economic conditions to their to their families. You know, even though today there are still obviously lots of parts of the world that are in strife, but overall there's sort of like less conflict than there was, you know, in, in human history. But there's also a lot of migration that's that's happening now and going to happen even more so with climate change. Um, and I wonder if 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 you could talk a little bit about sort of you know this this new way of thinking about uh, GDP or a or a, a country's wealth as it trickles down to its people, even when say issues of climate change might send the jobs elsewhere. So I imagine you know as the as the climate changes, there's going to be jobs in different parts of the world, and we're going to have to you know send workers or people have to go to those parts of the world to get the jobs that and and then send money home. I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about what you think about the future of, um, you know, is this is this going to just the, the idea that families have family members who are working abroad going to expand and increase? Or do you see it as kind of where it is now is how it's going to stay and what impact that has on money movement? I think we're going to continue to see a lot of transformation in terms of borderless um, working conditions you may be uh, you we are starting to see that no you may mm -hmm. be working from home in uruguay but i mean working for a multinational mm -hmm. in italy you know and yeah. your employment and employment lows and will continue to evolve and so migrating to a a, a different country may not be the the real answer but r remote working without physical migration may be a, a, a thing uh, to alleviate poverty in many uh, low-income uh, economies. No? Mm -hmm. I, I think the migration you are going to see here are, 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 are more or less the same, you know, wars, uh, national disasters, um, you know, internal conflicts and, you know, climate change will, will also contribute to that. Um, during the flows in Honduras and Nicaragua or Puerto Rico, you start seeing a, a massive, I mean, number of people leaving their countries as well. 
because their land is destroyed. There is no way to have uh, agriculture there, etc. Or when big factories close in one country and move to, to another, you, you start seeing people following the money, following the, the resources, following the income uh, in order to continue to provide to, to their families. Mm -hmm. So we're going to continue to see a lot of that. Money movement will be critical also because, you know, there are many other trends that are fueling, I mean, the need for remote working no? or um, these conditions of independent contractors. As these platforms grow across markets, the need to change the way of, you know, this payroll relationship uh, will uh, demand a better money movement platform. No? Instead, you could provide your, you know, debit number and receive the payment directly to your uh, Visa card. That simplicity will reduce costs because it's end-to-end -end digital um, and will uh, promote a, a better um, money movement ecosystem in the long run. I mean, I can see how promoting a better money movement ecosystem could drive the digital revolution. You know, there was the the sort of uh, tech 1.0 that happened in the early 2000s, and a lot of companies failed, and there was a big crash. I think in part because it wasn't easy. The security of, of money movement was not there yet, that infrastructure. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how how has Visa Direct, you know, made this possible? It's, it, there's just so many changes that have happened in the last two decades in terms of, you know, the security and the and the ease with which we can pay each other. So like, what's the infrastructure behind this that has made it possible? Well, as you know, we have been operating a very efficient payment network during the last 60 years. No? And we have been developing these two size economy between the issuers of these um, credentials and who is accepting the credentials, which are the merchants. No. So mm. right now we have probably the largest and the most ubiquitous global payment network on earth uh, in Visa. No? Mm -hmm. In this, the same philosophy and the same principle that we applied. So in one side, you will have um, big uh, remitters like Western Union or, you know, big banks like Bank of America or JP Morgan trying to send money to individuals by leveraging the same credential that they have in their pocket. No? So mm. they don't need to, to have additional bank account. They do not need to have, you know, to pay for a wire transfer. They will receive the transaction as a credit position directly in this, um, in this instrument that they are so used to, uh, mm. uh, do, and they have been using during the last, you know, 50 years. And that's that's the simplicity of the network. We are not we we are not recreating um, technology. We are repurposing credentials and repurposing technology. So instead of just pay in front of a merchant, you have the ability to receive the funds directly in the instrument that you are used to uh, during all these years. So, Ruben, we've been talking a lot about sort of the the challenges or the differences uh, of money movement in places like Latin America. But you've also spent time in Singapore. Um, and are, are there parts of Asia or other you know, parts of the world where there are sort of cultural differences in which kind of put up different obstacles for the money movement that Visa Direct provides? Well, I think Asia uh, is a very interesting um, marketing has been evolving organically into digital uh, during the last 10 years. No? You have, I mean, huge digital platforms um, in China. China were one of the first markets with huge adoption in terms of digital wallets. No? You have the, mm. the Alipay, you know, some other big players there that are, I mean, providing um, not, not only financial services, but almost everything you can think of, you can, it happens in the app. No? It's um, the first phenomenon of, of, of a super app happen in China. No? Mm. And you also have another, another aspect. Um, you have 
one of the largest uh, countries in terms of population in Asia. You have Indonesia, you have India, and you have China. And the, those are, you know, incredibly massive uh, territories, but also, I mean, very large uh, number of individuals uh, living in, 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 in these markets. And solving for them, it is a matter of uh, digital reach, you know, and all of them are doing uh, different um, um, exercises to, to, to reach, but it has been very organic. A lot of, you know, fintechs and a lot of uh, government initiatives and some other um, private sector initiative has been making these um, uh, markets very uh, digitally oriented. Uh, mm. uh, I will say the penetration of, uh, you know, digital in China is one of the best in the world. No? And with this um, demonetization effort that India went through like five or six years ago, more or less, um, they they really transformed the way it, uh, the economies are 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 moving money and they are making significant investing investment in the domestic markets to create better uh, digital infrastructure the the problem with some of those is that uh, most of these developments are for for domestic transactions mm. so even though they have this sophistication in the domestic uh, markets they may not have all the connectivity with the world so the challenge for uh, us is tr how we are going to partner and to work with all these digital platforms that exist in these markets to make uh, a connectivity between visas uh, architecture in money movement and the domestic um, uh, platforms and the domestic wallets that exist there but um, the penetration of digital in these markets is just impressive um, and very advanced in, in many ways. Yeah, so they're ready. They are absolutely ready. You know, it's uh, there. There still are a lot of cultural differences between countries in terms of how banking works. I remember um, my family and I went and spent three months in France, and it, it literally took the full three months for me to open up a bank account because there were so many hurdles to jump through. Um, and so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how Visa Direct takes into account or works around these cultural differences. Um, and, and, you know, are, are there particular examples of countries that in which that has been more challenging or, you know, what are some of the ways in which it's differed between countries? Um, access to banking is a challenge everywhere. Um, it, it, you know, is this it probably is more pronounced or more acute in in low and middle income uh, markets, but it's, real, it's also a reality in many um, developed markets. There are between 1.4 and 1.7 billion individuals out there without access to basic banking services, mm -hmm. or they are underserved, meaning they may have a kind of a few or very little access to, to banking products. No? So in, in many markets, mobile wallets are becoming like a very valid instrument. You know, they, they are using these for day-to-day -day financial transactions. And in some cases, allows them to buy, to sell, and to receive money. Mm. Um, and they are, in, in many cases, they, are, uh, they do not have a, a bank account. No? They operate without uh, any bank account. They operate with, with cash economy, dash digital economy. Um, in order to to you know go around their day to day um, with you know if you are a small merchant you know buying and selling and if you are I mean an individual receiving money from your family your parents um, to you know subsists um, in 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 the everyday. You know? Yeah, I mean I think just like in some ways in parts of the world where there there is more poverty where there is less access to banking um cell phones made a huge difference in in that people can carry around now these digital wallets i wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of are are there things that like what are what is sort of the the technical side of um 
creating these digital wallets uh, that that make it possible for people to like not even necessarily have a bank account, um, but can still receive cash. Sort of what's the what's the tech side behind that? Well, a digital wallet is technically a container that uh, records your um, economic, inf- I mean, uh, power. No, <laughs> they mm-hmm. Do, mm-hmm. you can upload money to them, uh, cash or any uh, other digital form, uh, so you can have it handy when you want to pay in front of a a merchant or you want to send money to somebody else. No? They have eliminated the barrier of uh, entry for many uh, uh, low income families to actually participate in a bigger, larger digital economy by providing them this this useful uh, digital container to, you know, um, uphold uh, these funds. No? Mm-hmm. And from there, they can perform commerce or they can, you know, transact with other individuals. Um, so, you know, part of what we're trying to do with Visa Direct is to uh, land the transaction not only in the typical credentials into, uh, you know, a card number, but also into wallets. No, so we are using the credential of that particular wallet to land the transaction that somebody in in the U.S. is uh, or in Europe or in so many other markets are sending to this individual. Um, th- that will create a, an important reach uh, because of these 1.4 and 1.7 individuals who do not have access to traditional banking and hence not access to a debit card or not access mm-hmm. to a bank account to land the transaction. And, you know, we're talking about almost 700, 800 billion dollars of flows that are coming from, you know, um, many markets to provide this uh, financial aid to 800 million individuals who are living uh, around the world. So it's a massive, um, you know, reach. Yeah, and a, a massive difference in these people's lives, too, I imagine. But there are still some places where it doesn't seem to be as seamless. So recently, um, my husband and I went to Argentina to celebrate our 15th wedding anniversary. And we didn't, it didn't even occur to us that it would be difficult to pay for things with our phones, you know, that we could use, you know, Venmo or cash apps just as easily as we do anywhere else. And that's just just wasn't true uh, in Argentina, you know, for various reasons it, it we we got we were a bit stranded and there were places where people really wanted cash and we couldn't do the things that we wanted to do because we had no access to cash. But I wonder if you could talk a little bit about sort of what why was it so hard in places like Argentina to use these apps that se- make it seem so easy elsewhere in the world? I think the level of uh, digitization um country by country will continue to have some sort of disparity. Um, Mm -hmm. It's based on, you know, how the financial system has been evolved, been during years. It's based on connectivity and in based on the availability of these um, digital wallets in in market. Um, What is happening is, is some, I mean, developed markets, people may have access to a bank account or or a you know more sophisticated uh, financial tools, but in order to land this transaction in places like Argentina or Bangladesh or India or Mexico, the the recipient may not have access to the same sort of mm. banking sophistication. So how we're going to make this uh, ecosystem more interoperable is something that we I mean dedicate a lot of time. That's why our effort to make this visa direct money movement facility more ubiquitous is 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 a very strong value proposition in the long term. That means that we have coverage with high banking population, um, individuals who have a bank but not a debit card, individuals mm-hmm. who do not have a bank, not a debit card, but they have um digital container to to receive these funds 
that there is a, a, a massive reach and a massive uh, footprint that will serve um, as a catalyst to you know um, serve more and more um, individuals and connect more and more I mean senders and receivers. So I kind of have a follow up question there. It seems that like the peer to peer transactions are becoming more efficient, but that B two B or business to business is slower to change. What is there an, a different approach that you're that you're taking to make B two B transactions simpler and faster? I believe B two B will take some more time to solve. B two B generally uh, requires some slow. I mean. Uh, uh, speed. Uh, it's, I mean, a, a business is not dying to receive the uh, the funds in you know immediately in a matter of seconds in a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, they have big layers and they can operate you know with I mean credits etc. Uh, but that is also uh, uh, is changing. Visa Direct is is focusing in the you know uh, kind of retail size of the transactions. Um, and we are trying to solve for immediacy um, because it makes a big difference for somebody who's waiting to pay for utilities or, you know, pay for the supermarket uh, and is waiting for somebody in Spain, in UK or in the US to send that monthly allowance to be able to carry on with their lives. So there... Um, I will say real time or near near real time is is critical. It's important. It needs to be part of the value proposition. When you send to your friends, you know, the payment for your last dinner party. I mean, they are expecting that immediately when you take your Uber back home. You know, mm -hmm. so that that's that's the reality of um, the space where Visa Direct is is solving. And, and real time is real time will become one of the largest changes in payments during the next three to five years. It's because we are facing a consumer that is more uh, looking for immediate uh, rewards and immediate satisfaction, you know, and and mm -hmm. they are used to this um, almost real time. Uh, um, living uh, conditions if they post something in instagram they are they wait in the screen until somebody put like you know um, because they want this instant gratification um, but it's not only that it's, it's because um, if you are an uber driver or you are a lift driver um, as soon as you finish your your work in during the day you want to get paid because you are providing a service to, to these big companies. So how are you going to do it? And so real-time payments will, will become a, a, a real uh, issue to create more dynamics, uh, uh, dynamic economies. No? If you are an Uber driver and you don't receive your payment for all the service you provide during the day, and you are working with a very tight micro economy, you may not have uh, the funds to put gas in your car and continue to provide the service. So real time is, is, is critical. But I want to end with, um, before we get to our, our rapid fire questions, um, you know, you've written that when you were growing up in El Salvador, people living in extreme poverty were defined as those who spend their daily purchasing power on food and still go to sleep hungry. But today, as you noted, it's a, the, the definition of poverty is really a function of daily income indexed to U.S. dollars. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about the implications of changing this definition of poverty from something concrete and personal, like not having enough to eat, to something more abstract, like some amount of U.S. dollars, and even more abstract when there's not even an exchange of cash anymore, if it's just this digital wallet and we don't even see anything physically being exchanged. I think the World Bank changed that um, as part of the millennial goals to have a, a better uh, metric to, to trace. Um, mm. what, what, you, you may not have income in countries like Vietnam or Cambodia, 
but you may have food because you are owner of a small parcel of agriculture. But that doesn't mean that uh, you are struggling uh, economically. I mean, the reason that you have a, you know, your own self-sufficient, I mean, way of living or way to secure food, uh, that is more on the food security point of view, but not from the uh, defining the poverty line. So that's the reason why the, 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 I believe the United Nations and the World Bank and many other big uh, institutions get together to agree on how we're going to measure poverty going forward. And I think it's a it's a more pragmatic way of seeing it, um, because of these um, nuances of you know I may actually be able to secure food today, but that doesn't mean I have a cent in my pocket, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't worry about, you know, kids growing up now, like my, my kid the other day, uh, you know, one of them wanted something and I said, you know, we just don't have the money for it. And so my four year old went and got my phone and said, here, it's in, it's in here, the money's in the phone. <laughs> I mean, is there are there implications of like, the fact that they don't actually see anything exchanging? It's so abstract. It is. I mean, but always, I mean, money has not never been an issue of physical ownership, you know, uh, I think in the entire monetary mass, I believe a very small percentage is actually printed. You know, mm -hmm. everything is zeros and bytes in your checking, your savings account, your investment accounts. You never get to touch the money, you know, right. and yeah. this uh, invisible condition of money requires a lot of education, especially in, in developed markets. In the other markets, it's the other way around. How do I make this physical money into digital so I can use it better or I can protect mm. it better? You know? So in both sides of the equation, uh, financial education continues to be critical for highly digitized markets and to other markets where cash is still very dominant. Cash is still the king, I mean, uh, in many ways. Mm -hmm. In Latin America, for example, I will say more than 70% of all the uh, transactions and all the commerce is happening in physical cash. It's not mm -hmm. happening in, in, in cars or in, in, in digital instruments. So it, it, it is still a very large frontier and in a very large headroom for uh, Visa to, to grow. Yep. So on Money Travels, we like to end each episode with some rapid fire questions. So if you're ready, um, we'll get those going. OK, what developing technology do you predict will change once again how money moves between people or businesses? Real time. What do you think you'll miss most when cash no longer exists? Nothing. <laughs> What do you find most annoying in money movement today? Long lines. What aspect of money movement is more complicated than most people think? Security. And can you predict the future of money movement with a single catchy phrase? Everywhere you want to be. <laughs> That's great. Ruben Salazar, thank you so much for being on Money Travels. Thank you, Indre. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the first episode of Money Travels. If you've enjoyed it, please subscribe or follow the show and leave a review so more people can find it. Until next time, I'm Indre Viscontis, and this has been Money Travels, presented by Visa. Visa.